the website and the Instagram account. You really have to have both if you're an artist. The thing is, though, they're really different beasts and they also serve completely different purposes. But you got to have both. You really should not only have one if you want to work professionally as an artist. The way I describe the relationship, your artist website, it's like a file cabinet. It's where you keep all your important papers that you don't want to lose, but it's not what you're working on right now. It's really an archive. So on a website, you probably have pieces on there that are many, many years old, and that's totally fine. Your artist Instagram really is the day to day. What happened in the past few days? What am I anticipating towards tomorrow? And they really complement each other very well in that sense. Now, we're not going to talk about websites today because I already have that covered. We have this video. It's in the Career Advice for Artists playlist. And I go over all the different aspects of creating an artist website. And we also have this video that you guys might want to watch. It is a critique of an artist website. And so I just go through the artist website. I make observations about the different areas of their website and I suggest different changes. So sometimes that's really nice to be able to see, oh, well, this is what one artist is doing and here are some of the changes that maybe need to be made. Another option, if you want really custom tailored advice, which actually for websites pretty important because depending on who you are, what type of work you do and what your um, goals are for your work, it can be really, really different. So we do have this option. If you go to ourprof.org and you click on purchase a critique, we do offer video critiques of your Instagram or your website. So that might be something some of you guys want to consider for the future. XO is saying, can ArtStation be a substitute for the archival function of a website. It depends if that's the field you want to work in, Axo, because I know that ArtStation is pretty specific to concept artists and people working in visual development. It could be if that is the only world you want to be working in and you're not trying to get your work into other fields, you might be okay. But the thing is, I think for a lot of people, really looking professional means having your own site. So in theory, the ideal situation, you have your website, you have your Instagram, and you also have ArtStation. I really think the website and the Instagram are essential and everything else is extra. Okay, let's dig in. The way I think about social media, it's where the party is. It's where everybody is hanging out. So the thing about your website is yes, it's important and you have to have your website, but it's not really representative of you right now in this moment. And that's what social media is. And that's where people are gonna go to try to interact with you. Nobody goes to your website to have a conversation, to ask you a question, because that's not really an option. I suppose they could send you an email, but that's a lot more formal, I think, than just commenting on somebody's Instagram. So social media has a real casual quality to it that I think lets people access you much faster, which for the most part is pretty much a good thing when you're trying to really get yourself out there as an artist. I think what's really challenging about social media though, it's always changing and it drives me up the wall because the second I think, okay, I have this thing sort of figured out, Instagram will release like three new updates Twitter changes things. They say, oh, it was 140 characters. Now it's 280. And then you always feel with social media that you almost have to be relearning things all the time. Like, did anybody notice on Instagram? I think it was two days ago. They changed something about the stories. And I went, oh, are you serious? I was just starting to figure out all the other features that they had. And now they're giving us something different. In theory, I guess it's better if I take a look and try to learn it. But this is what I think is so hard for people is that it's difficult to do to begin with, but then with all the changes, it can feel very daunting to stay on top of all of these different changes. The other thing about social media that I think a lot of people don't understand or maybe don't want to believe is that contrary to popular opinion, social media 
it takes a long time. And when I say time, guys, I mean years. I think, unfortunately, I think when people see a phone, they go, oh, this is so easy. Just tap, tap, tap. That's not going to be hard. That's not a lot of work. Nothing could be further from the truth, you guys. The people I know who have very large established Instagram followings, that did not happen overnight. That is something that people really spend a lot of time on. And the people I know who have very good, solid Instagram accounts, they spend a huge amount of time. And I don't just mean like, oh, a couple hours once a week. I mean like every single day. It's like taking the photos, writing the captions, queuing things up. It's a huge amount of work, you guys. So don't tell yourself if you've been on Instagram for three months, oh my gosh, what am I doing wrong? I don't have tons of followers. That's why. It can take years. I talked to somebody who said it took them five years to get to 10,000 followers, and that's somebody who worked their butt off. This is not somebody who just passively sat along. And so this is what I think people are surprised about. Basically, guys, I'm going to tell you everything you probably don't want to hear. I'm going to tell you it's a ton of work. I'm going to tell you you got to do it all the time. You've got to stay up to date and that it's going to eat up all your time. And you're going to think to yourself, oh, my goodness, when am I going to have time to make my own artwork? Yes, that is the million dollar question that we are going to try to work on. OK, the way I like to think about social media, it's like a houseplant. It's a houseplant in that you don't want to ignore it. <laughs> like, Does anybody here tell me in the chat, do you guys have any dead houseplants that just did not make it in your house because there's like five of them in my kitchen right now. And I feel so guilty about it that I have not thrown them out yet, even though I should just put them out of their misery. But that's what social media is. If you ignore it for too long, you're not going to have a good social media presence. Now, on the other hand, you don't want to overwater it. Like, has anybody here ever like killed a plant because you were so aggressive about watering it that it totally died as well? I mean, this is the story of every plant's life in my house. <laughs> but don't overwater it because if you get too aggressive and you're bothering people all the time and you're posting eight times a day, that can actually get people to unfollow you in a heartbeat. So it's a very fine line that you want to be persistent and you want to put the work out there, but not so aggressively that it's actually driving people away. That's the really tricky thing. Lauren is saying, really take the time to learn how the algorithm works. Yep, it can be very mysterious, but that's definitely something you guys should be researching online because I think that Instagram definitely, it's like a game. I mean, I feel like YouTube is almost the same thing. Like you have to understand the algorithm, what is the mindset behind it, what it looks for. And so in a lot of ways, I really feel like when I'm doing Instagram and YouTube, half the time, I feel like I'm playing a video game. Like if I do these three things, hopefully I will get three gold coins by the time I'm finished. Okay. Now, people ask me a lot about posting frequency. And again, everything I'm going to tell you guys tonight about social media, you have to take all of it with a grain of salt because it really depends on who you are who your audience is, what your work is, and how quickly you can produce your stuff. And so for some people, posting frequently is really easy. For other people, it's impossible. So it really, really depends. But I would say on average, to make sure people don't completely forget about you, I would say social media about once a week. I'd say three times a week is totally fine without irritating people. Website, you can get away with like three months, maybe even longer than that without touching your website, assuming that there's enough content on there for it to not look like a completely unfinished website. Like I honestly can't remember the last time I updated something on my website. And I think the last time I did, it was to add like one line to my resume. So it was definitely not anything significant. Social media is definitely the one that is harder to maintain. The thing about the website, the website's a ton of work. Like just to get it up and running, having everything formatted, having it look good, that's a lot of upfront work. But then it's like an air plant. You don't have to water it. Well, actually, with air plants, you just miss them. So it's a little bit less maintenance. Social media, you really have to actually take care of it. 10,000 Crows is saying tips for writing captions. We are going to get into that. But in a nutshell, 10,000 Crows, make it 
personal. Don't say stuff like, look at this cool drawing I made. Say something about what your experience was making that work. You just want to not be generic. If you look at five artist Instagram accounts, you can probably figure out what are the three things that we all end up saying on social media. Hey, I made this new piece. I'm excited about it. Wow, I just started experimenting with these new brush pens. I mean, we all say the same thing. So the question is, how do you become a more unique voice amongst all those generic statements? Let's see, Rebecca Cortez is saying, wouldn't it be a tough situation to gain views or followers if people repost? Uh, let's see, it looks like that comment got cut off. So I'll come back to that in a little bit. People ask me a lot, should I post more than once a day? Again, some people can get away with that. I have to tell you guys from my point of view, I get really annoyed with people that post multiple times a day. This is sort of an extreme version of it, but actually one of my really good friends does this. And she does this strange thing where she doesn't post for like three months. And then all of a sudden it's literally 15 images in a day. And it bothers me so much. Like I feel really bad at actually unfollowing her. <laughs> sorry, I know you're my friend, but I just can't do it. And so maybe if you're Katy Perry, it's okay. And you've got 50 million followers, but I know I get annoyed by that. So I generally don't do that. I have been sort of horribly lazy about my own Instagram. So please do not look at me as an example necessarily. But I think once a day is the limit, in my opinion. When Willoughby is saying is that one to three times a week for finished things, sketches, works in progress, what sort of things are still arty, but best for just stories? When I would say one to three times a week is anything. Any post of anything that you want to make doesn't matter if it's a sketch finished in progress. And we will go over later more different ideas for content. Okay, let's talk about a couple of options because I do think although I'm going to focus on Instagram, I do actually get a lot of questions from people about Facebook, about Twitter, because although most of my time is really spent on my Instagram, I do still use Facebook and Twitter for very particular reasons. So I think this is worth listening to because even though you may not have like a huge presence on Twitter, you might actually find it very good as a research tool. So we'll get into that in a minute. All right, so Facebook, I honestly think Facebook is gonna disappear pretty soon. And wow, they were smart to buy Instagram because if they hadn't bought Instagram, <laughs> I think it would have been over for them a long time ago. But the thing about Facebook is that you can have, for example, a personal profile, which a lot of people have. And that's more for making your friends jealous that you went to Austria and you were sipping margaritas in Florida in December. Of course, why else would you want to post stuff on Facebook? Or you can have a Facebook page which honestly, if you don't have a Facebook page, don't bother. There's no point. I started my Facebook page a really long time ago. And so for me, it's not a lot of work to maintain it. But I have to tell you, I'm spending less and less time on that page because I'm just seeing so much more traction in other areas. But if you are wondering about it, don't bother with Facebook for now. I think it's really not that necessary. Kareth is asking, any opinions on starting a YouTube account for art tutorials or something similar? All right, we probably need an entire stream just for that. But you know what, Kareth, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about in this stream is going to be very relevant as far as interaction. And having a YouTube account, a huge portion of that is interacting with your audience. People really care tremendously about how you speak to them, about the effort you put into that. And we're gonna definitely talk about that in this stream. Mariana is saying, how many posts of the same piece would it be okay to post in a row as the work progresses, especially if it's a big project? I think it's fine to do that, Mariana, as long as there's enough visible progress in the next photo. For example, oftentimes I see people, they post works in progress and they post the second one and I go, what changed? Like if I can't visibly obviously tell what changed, it's probably too soon for a post. Now, if you want to do something where things are a little bit more similar, you could embed them into a single post 
which is called a carousel post. And I'll show you guys how to do that in a little bit. Okay, now I'm a big fan of Instagram because you can have a public account and you can have a private account. And just the whole thing about Instagram that's better, for those of you who are still on Facebook and wondering whether you should get onto Instagram, leave right away <laughs> because Facebook is just so complicated. Like, have you guys noticed that on Facebook, there's 15,000 options when you wanna make a post. I'm like, really? I need to pick whether I wanna start a watch party or not. I just wanna post the freaking thing. I like Instagram because it's very straightforward. It's like, here's the picture, write something, tag a thing, post. It's so much easier. It's a lot more streamlined. So if any of you here are still having doubts about Instagram, let me just expel that for you and tell you get onto Instagram now because it's just so much more streamlined than Facebook. Okay, and then you guys can see this is Jordan McCracken Foster, who is an art prof teaching artist, and he has a public account. So this is viewable to everybody, but a lot of people also have private accounts. And so it's really nice actually to be able to separate those things because I know with Facebook for a lot of people, the, I guess, division between professional and personal, sometimes it gets blurry and that's not always a good thing for a lot of people, especially when you're trying to become a professional artist. Okay, now Twitter can be useful. I don't think it's super useful for artists as far as posting your work. I have seen some people use it, more of the people that I see using Twitter are people who are illustrators, people working in animation. I really don't see a lot of fine art people using Twitter very much, but you can use it. And I use it specifically for research purposes. I use it because I follow a lot of journalists. I follow particular art publications. So that way I can stay on top of a lot of the news. I have a big crush on Ari Shapiro. So I got to know what he's doing eight times a day. So Twitter has its uses. And I definitely have contacted some journalists and press people that way. But compared to the amount of time I actually invest in cultivating Instagram, it's very, very small by comparison. Albert is saying, is it all right if I don't post my artwork at all on Instagram? I really don't feel like I can contextualize it well on Instagram. I mean, it's your choice. I just think that out of all the options that are available right now to show your work, Instagram is the best one right now. And I'm going to get into all those reasons. But if you feel that there's another platform that is better suited for what you want to do, then do it. Like I said, everybody's different. For some people, it's not the best choice. Okay. So I am on Twitter. You guys can follow me there for all my silly little nitty gritty things, comments about matcha green tea as being a good paint material. <laughs> you guys can check some of that out. I get a lot of questions about LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is very funny because I know a lot of schools pressure a lot of students, oh, you must get on LinkedIn. Like it's this hugely important part of being a professional. But the thing is, I have never found LinkedIn useful as an artist, okay? I can say probably if you're in a different field, maybe if you work in marketing or business or communications, maybe it's better for another field. But I can tell you for artists, not helpful. Basically, for artists, it's a place to put your resume there. Great. I mean, that's not going to hurt. It's okay for you to have your resume there. And people are always sending me requests to connect with them on LinkedIn, but it has never led to a single thing. I have never had anything actually develop from a LinkedIn connection. So I would say, you guys, go ahead if you want to put it there. It's not going to hurt you. But don't let the career services at your school or whatever bully you <laughs> into feeling like you have to be on LinkedIn because you really don't. It's really not a big deal. Okay, I am again on LinkedIn. So you can check that out. And again, I just it just sits there. I don't really do anything with it. So it does not hurt, but don't stress if you are worried about that. Okay, I think this is the most important question you need to ask yourself if you want to use social media. And this also goes for YouTube as well. So Kareth, you were asking about YouTube. You need to ask yourself, who is your target audience, okay? Are you on Instagram because you are trying to make connections with gallery directors? You're trying to get in touch with a curator. 
Maybe you're an art educator. Maybe you teach high school and you're trying to get different ideas from other high school art educators. Maybe you're an art school student and you want to see what other art school students are doing. Maybe you're a lifelong learner and you just picked up art a few years ago and you're trying to get tips from various artists. So you got to figure out who you're trying to target because depending on who you're trying to target, that really does tremendously influence how you end up choosing what to post and when to post and how to post. So keep this in mind because I think this is one of those bigger goals that people just forget about. Like they don't realize, okay, why am I doing this to begin with? Because I feel like, especially for a lot of artists, there's so much pressure to like, oh, you got to be on Instagram. You got to be posting your stuff, but you got to stop yourself. You got to say, why am I posting this? And who am I actually trying to reach? That's very important to identify. Okay. Age demographic. Also an important thing to consider because I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but um, the young kids, they're not on Facebook, guys. Yep. Those of you like me who are old farts, people who are ages 40 and up, we're the only ones using Facebook. My daughter doesn't use Facebook. The high school kids aren't using Facebook. The high school students and the younger adults, like people in their early 20s and stuff, they're on Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. The older people are like, what's TikTok? So what happens with social media is that there's this huge divide in terms of generations. So this is one of the reasons I didn't want to make this video just about Instagram, because here's the thing, okay? If you just got out of college, okay, and you're trying to get into a gallery somehow, all right? The gallery directors they're not 21 years old, okay? Most of the dealers, the curators, I suppose there's probably a few curators out there that are maybe in their 30s, but people who are curators, they tend to be older. They tend to be at least 40, 50, 60. So people in that age demographic, they're not looking at TikTok. So it would be a big mistake for you to think, oh, if I get on TikTok, I'll attract all those curators. You won't. And actually you have to really think about that who it is, what their age is probably going to be. If you are starting a platform, you're trying to teach high school students how to draw, you probably should be on Instagram and TikTok because that are, is platforms that is relevant to those age demographics. So that is very important, I think, to identify. Okay, I can't pronounce this name. It's a Japanese name, but they're saying, is having a social media account seen as required for artists? It's really, I think, required if you're trying to have a professional standing as an artist. I think if you are just making art and you're enjoying yourself and you're learning, it's not required by any means in that situation. But I would say if you are trying to establish a professional career, that is pretty much the expectation now. And they're also saying, what about following trends of art? Is it a do or a don't? I would say that's a matter of opinion. I can tell you my opinion is it's a don't because I think that you are probably not going to be that excited about making artwork that you're making to please somebody else. I have never had a good time doing that myself. In fact, I probably would really, really not enjoy doing something like that. So I would say you can try that for sure, but I just think that trends go away after a little while. So why do you want to follow a trend and make artwork you don't like only to have it die a few months later and then you got to do a new trial. Like, I don't think that makes any sense. In my opinion, you should make the work that you want to make and find your place for it because there's a place for everything. This is a huge world that we live in. It's just, you got to find that audience. That's the thing that I think is extremely difficult. Okay. This is a huge generalization, but there are certain platforms that I think are somewhat more catered to certain professions. I see Facebook pages, it's more businesses than it is artists on Twitter. A lot of writers are on Twitter. People who are journalists are on Twitter all day. Like, honestly, I follow all these journalists. I'm like, how do you guys have time to do anything? You're on Twitter like all day long. Although for a lot of them, I think they do use Twitter as a means of communication. Instagram, I think galleries are using it, artists, the major museums. Instagram really, I think, carved a place for itself where it really is being used by major galleries and museums. It's no longer 
just for random people who are making art. It really is being used as a professional tool. Pinterest, I think, is pretty particular. I don't use Pinterest very much. I know a lot of people use it to find reference images for their artwork. But what I do see is that a lot of educators really like Pinterest. I see a lot of people use it for project ideas or craft projects and stuff like that. So I have seen that it has been um, very useful for that type of thing. Albert is saying, but are gallery curators looking at Twitter or Facebook for finding new artists? I see most galleries aren't taking submissions because they are going to MFA open studio visits. Okay, Albert, we probably need to do another stream on that because it would take me so long to explain. They are not looking at Twitter or Facebook, but Twitter or Facebook or Instagram rather more likely, it can be the back door. And so it won't take you right there, but it can set the circumstances to make something like that much more likely to happen. So again, we'll have to do a stream on that later. Erica B is saying, do many artists still use Tumblr? I can see some benefits from that, but I feel like no one talks about it anymore. Erica B, I had a Tumblr for a little while. I have not touched it in years. I think Tumblr is done. I think people are not on it anymore. It just started to get, from what I've seen, a really bad reputation in terms of content. And everybody just migrated to Instagram. So I would say, don't worry about Tumblr. Okay. I do think you guys, it's important to think about what is a more professional platform and what's a more personal platform. For example, your Facebook profile, that's not really something you wanna be using for your professional life. I know Snapchat for a lot of people is just within their personal friends. LinkedIn, obviously that's not where you post your baby photos. And so you have to understand with social media that there are certain platforms where there is this association of, oh, that's for personal content this is for professional content. And there's a lot of crossover. I mean, there's a lot of stuff where it's like, well, it could be this, it could be that. But it's very good to be conscious of that because I do think that you have to consider the line between professional and personal before you start any of this. Because the thing is, once you guys put anything out there, it's out there forever. And I know people are like, oh, well, it'll disappear. I'm like, no, <laughs> people can screenshot my rule about content on the internet is anything that can be screenshot or that I don't want read in a courtroom does not go online anywhere. I think you can never be too conservative about that type of thing. Okay, so content format. Now here's the thing, there's a lot of platforms that accept multiple types of content. For example, on Twitter, you can post links and you can post video links and you can post photos, but in general, People don't go to Twitter to watch videos. If you wanna watch a video, you're gonna to go to YouTube. People generally do not go to Instagram to look at videos because there's a limit of one minute. So you can watch a video on Instagram, but it's not where you're gonna really sit through something really substantially. Facebook, again, you can watch a video and you can write something, but I feel like for the most part from what I've seen with Facebook that a lot of it's just link sharing. So. It really depends, again, on your friends and who you're interacting with. But I think it is important to consider that people expect certain things from certain platforms. Art Alchemist is saying, I keep hearing about Discord. How is that for artists? Well, I would say if you are in the Art Prof Discord, it's awesome. <laughs> so you guys should join us on Discord. The invite is in the video description below. And it's really, really fun. We have so much more activity there than we ever had in our Facebook group. I think it's a lot more casual. I feel on Discord, people are not trying so hard to impress each other. It seems much more about the conversation. That's been my experience. It could be different for other people, but I have found it to be a really good tool and you guys should all hang out with us on Discord because it's really, really cool. Okay, so let's get back into the content format. Now, Instagram allows you to have five accounts, which some people look at and they go, oh my gosh, that's so much to manage. I do not want to deal with that. I actually love that Instagram allows five accounts because you know something? Then I can really organize the different parts of my life. For example, we have an Instagram for art prof. And so then I can keep my art prof stuff totally separate from my own studio practice. 
And so it's so much better because for the longest time, I had one Instagram for both. And it was just really confusing because the audience is, yeah, there's some overlap. I mean, there's some people that follow me on ArtProf who also follow my personal account, but it's not everybody. And so I think it's really nice to be able to streamline those audiences. Okay, let's talk about reaction time because this also varies tremendously across the platforms. Usually if I post something on Instagram or Twitter, I will get a reply within 24 hours. And then beyond that, nothing. So if I don't get a reply within 24 hours, that's probably where it's gonna end. I mean, once in a while, maybe one thing will trickle in, but pretty much no, okay? Facebook is a little longer. Usually Facebook, if I post something, 72 hours, things are still rolling in and then it sort of ends. Now, Pinterest, LinkedIn, and YouTube, it's like, it could be anything. <laughs> like I have videos that have been on our YouTube channel for three years and I'm still getting comments on them. So it's a really, really different frame of mind when you post content because on YouTube, I don't feel like, oh my goodness, that video performed terribly. It's over. In fact, it's the opposite. I mean, we've had some tutorials that were on the channel for like eight months and they did okay, but we had this one gua sha tutorial that totally exploded a couple months ago. We were like, what? <laughs> so the algorithm does these things on YouTube that doesn't happen in the same way that it might on Facebook or Instagram. Okay, short and sweet. This is the approach you guys need to take for social media. Because most people, when they're looking at social media, they're looking at it on a phone, okay? Every now and then I do glance at Instagram on my laptop, but that's usually when I'm trying to like cut and paste or like find somebody's handle. I'm not really looking at it. 99% of the time I'm on my phone. And wow, guys, I cannot believe how fast people scroll. And I know this because in my RISD classes, I'll see what the students are doing in between the drawing sessions, like we'll have breaks. And I'm not joking, guys. I mean, they will do this. They'll like sit here and they'll do this like so fast. I'm like, what are you guys even looking at? They're like, yeah, we're just looking. Like people do not slow down <laughs> when they're looking at social media. They do it extremely quickly, okay? So you guys, you cannot write anything really substantial or that requires deep philosophical thinking in an Instagram post. People just are not in the frame of mind for that when they're looking at Instagram. So here's the difference, guys. I see this a lot, like in the left-hand side, in the gray box, people write things like this in an Instagram caption. Hey everyone, I'm so totally thrilled to have this opportunity. It's been so much fun for me. I've worked really hard for that. You, know, you guys probably tuned out after like the eighth word that I said, right? Because nobody wants to hear any of that. Now, the thing is the blue box on the bottom, that has the exact same information that's in the gray box, but you're actually gonna read it because it's short and sweet, it's to the point. And I know some people will say things to me like, oh, but that blue box text, it feels so cold and it doesn't feel personal at all. And I'm like, okay, well you can do that and have people read it, or you can write your very personal padded statement that nobody's gonna read. So that's really, in my opinion, it's a little different if you have like a hardcore bunch of fans and they'll like read everything you write. That's a little bit different, but for most people that is generally not the case. Okay, let's talk about artwork photos because this is so important, you guys. This really will make or break your social media account. And yes, I'm sure you don't wanna hear this. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of thought but you will get results if you do a good job here, okay? This is one of those areas where you cannot make things worse by shooting really good quality photos. You want them to be excellent, you want them to be simple, and you want them to be accurate. So if somebody's looking at your collage, like we're looking at one by Eloise, who's one of our teaching artists here at Art Prof, you can see the colors very visibly, it's neatly cropped, this is by Song Kang, who did our scratch board tutorial for us. And you can see her lighting is perfect. There's no funky shadows. Nothing is ripped or torn. It's really nicely presented. And it's also really good, you guys, 
to shoot detail shots. So for example, this is a painting by Kathy Speranza, who I actually interviewed earlier this afternoon. And this is a detail of this larger painting. And so I think if you guys are gonna take your artwork photos, you're there, you might as well just snap a couple extra ones of these detail shots, because that can be really great for people to see the artwork more clearly, especially when people are looking at a phone, it's so small anyway that if you don't show a close up, oftentimes so much of the image just gets totally lost. So I really recommend doing that. Sterling Richards is saying, when would you photograph versus scan? Sterling, I usually don't scan because huh, I don't own a scanner, so <laughs> that's kind of convenient. But I think a lot of people do it for comics. Like I know a lot of people will use that non-photo blue pencil so they can do really quick sketching and then when they scan it, the non-photo blue pencil it doesn't show up. So a lot of people use it for that and for illustration. But for me, I just use photography and that's pretty straightforward. And if you guys need help, how to photograph your artwork, go to artprof.org, click on tutorials, click on art school portfolios guide. You will find this whole page has everything you guys need to know about shooting images. And just quick note, because 3D artwork, I think is the, the biggest offender <laughs> as far as bad quality artwork photos. I see this all the time. People have a sculpture, they don't bother to get a nice clean background. So you have this like patchwork quilt background with this horizon line, which looks really bad. Or a lot of times people will try to use fabric as a backdrop and that never works because fabric always wrinkles. It's like, it doesn't matter how much you iron it. There's always something that wrinkles and it always shows up in the photo. So example of how to not have that is use a sheet of paper. This is what I do. I take the sheet of paper, I tack it on the wall and I bring it downwards. So that way it lies flat on the table. I place the object on it and then you get a nice clean photo. Paper doesn't wrinkle and it's great. So if you guys want more tips on how to do that, again, same page, just go to the section that says photographing 3D artwork and that will give you guys all of the cheat sheets. Okay, in your photos, it's really, really helpful to show the size of the art by putting it next to a person. For example, these are by Lauren Welch, one of our teaching artists, and she created these beautiful laser cut coasters. So if you look at the image on the top left, that's great. I mean, you can see the artwork really clearly. I'm not saying you shouldn't use that photo, but does everybody see how the photo with Lauren's hand in it it totally changes your perception of the coaster because all of a sudden you understand how big it is. And especially those of you who are wanting to sell artwork in an online shop or even directly on Instagram, this is so important because if people don't know how big something is, if they're buying a cup, they don't know if it's six inches or if it's six and a half, that really for a lot of people is a big deal breaker. So if you do something like that, that's really helpful. You can do the same thing with paintings. So if you have somebody standing in front of the painting, it can really just in two seconds show people so quickly what the artwork is really like. Because if you don't see it with a person, it's like it really could be anything. That's what I think is so challenging about showing our artwork online. Somebody is asking how to prevent theft of the artwork. We're actually gonna go over that later this month when I talk about business tips. But I will tell you right now that the only way you can 100% prevent that from happening, never post your artwork online. That's the only way. <laughs> There's no other option. Because I know some people think, oh, well, I'll put this watermark of my name on it. And I'm like, yeah, but that looks really tacky. And honestly, if I wanted to steal it, I would just do a Photoshop job and that would be fine. So I will get into that in another stream. It's just, it's too much to cover for this one stream. Okay, I do think you guys on Instagram you should occasionally show your face. Okay, I know some people are deeply uncomfortable with this. A lot of people go, oh no, I can't do it. I don't wanna have my face on my Instagram, okay? I get it, okay? I know what that's like. But I'll tell you guys, today, the artwork is not just the artwork anymore. It's a whole package. It's the artist as a person, the artist as a process the artwork and how all of that intertwines. 
And so oftentimes, if you guys go to an artist's Instagram account and there is no photo of the artist anywhere, I don't know about you guys, but I always feel like, is this a person? Are they real? <laughs> like, who are they? And so I just feel like every now and then you should have a photo of you doing something, okay? Now, here's the thing. I know, I know, we're not all as cool and hip as Eloise, who's shooting, oh my God, these awesome photos. I'm like, Eloise, could you be more like ultra cool and hip? Like, come on, you guys, who, who pulls off these photos? I do not understand. Definitely not me, okay? You will not find ultra hip photos of me like this on my Instagram, okay? You'll find pictures of me looking like a boring professor in a classroom. So that's pretty much who I am. So if you guys want to see more of Eloise's awesome, cool <laughs> portraits, you can go over to her Instagram. But I will tell you guys, if you show your face, you can do it in a number of different ways. You can get sort of artsy about it because you don't have to be so flashy about it. Like I'm not a flashy person. And so on my Instagram, I don't really have pictures like Eloise. It could be something where you're in a more professional context. Like for example, this is Tamara Miller, who is currently a RISD student. And so this is a picture she has on her Instagram when she was selling her artwork at a fair. And that's great because it's like the emphasis of this photo really is on her artwork. She just happens to be there. And so that's a way to sort of de-emphasize yourself in a way. A lot of people, they'll just have a friend take a couple pictures of themselves in the studio. And some people are a lot more comfortable with that because it's less that like seventh grade glamour shot you know, that we all like totally were traumatized by. Or something like this is also really nice to have in addition to the face photos is like, this is a photo of Deep D who is one of the art prof teaching artists. And I really like this photo a lot because it's up close and you can see her fingers and you can see her materials and it feels very personal. It feels very intimate. And so this is really important to have this broad range of images. Yep, I, I, I knew it, you guys. I'm reading in the chat how many of you <laughs> do not want to be on your Instagram as a face, but let me tell you guys, it goes a really long way, okay? Here's my example, okay? So I signed up my daughter for this cartooning class at a school and there were two sections open. It was two different instructors. And so of course I obsessively Googled them because I had to make sure that they were fully qualified to teach my 12 year old, of course. So I Googled both of them and one person was on all these sites. I could not find a single photo of them anywhere. This other person had a nice photo on their website. I thought, okay, good, well-adjusted person, not a serial killer, this is good. And between the two people, there honestly wasn't a huge difference in terms of their professional experience. And so take a wild guess who I chose. I chose the guy that had a real photo. And so it makes a difference, you guys. It really, really does. Okay. Next up, you want to show your tools and your art materials. People love this, you guys. It's the whole behind the scenes, get to know what's happening. And I'll tell you, I did not always think this about social media. I always thought that if I showed stuff like this, that it showed what a mess I was and what a complete disaster my studio was. But apparently people really enjoy seeing the mess. They enjoy seeing the tools. They like seeing the works in progress. And so the more you guys can give people insight into the behind the scenes part of your process, that is what's going to get people to come back. Because I actually have spoken to a lot of artists because this lecture I'm giving you guys right now, I've given this lecture a million times for the past few years. I give it at a lot of regional museums and artist associations. And so much of the time, People, they just say to me, well, I'm posting all the time. Why is nobody wanting to follow me? And so they show me their Instagram and every single photo is a finished artwork. And there's not a single work in progress. There's not a single image of the materials or their studio space. And I just say, that's why. Because every single post is finished and therefore we're not really getting any variety behind that. Builder D is saying self-portrait of posting a self-portrait of you making a self-portrait. I would like to see that, Builder D. If you end up doing that, tag me on Instagram and I will take a look at that. So anyway, the other cool thing about showing works in progress 
is it builds anticipation, okay? So if you guys were looking at songs drawing and here it's like halfway done, and then the next day she posts a little bit more, and then a few days later she posts to finish, you go, whoa, now I got to see how she created this. I understand the process. Whereas if song just puts out the finished thing and you never see anything about it beforehand, you're not as invested in her artistic journey. And that's what I think really makes an effective artist Instagram. Okay, exhibitions. If you do have the opportunity to have your work shown somewhere, definitely show it on Instagram. The one thing though, is you need to make sure you get to photograph the gallery when nobody is there in a shot like this. So this is a show that I did many years ago. And you also wanna have some photos of the space where there are people in the space. This is really useful, again, to show scale, to show the type of gallery that you're in. I think that's pretty helpful. Okay, this is where it starts to sound like a lot of work, okay? So for those of you who think you're gonna figure this out in a month, you might wanna go do something else. So this is what I do. And a lot of the people I know who are quite successful on Instagram do this as well. Queue up your images in advance, okay? Because I think what a lot of people do is they say, oh, I should post. Okay, what should I post today? Hmm, I have this photo, maybe this will look cool. Okay, what? and it's like, oh my God, that's a lot of work. So basically, if you queue up your images in advance, let's say you put in seven images, so you're seven posts ahead. Then you can plan in advance, okay, on Monday, I'm gonna post this picture of binding a book. On Wednesday, I'm gonna post a picture of myself teaching. On Saturday, it's gonna be these photos of my clay sculptures. So if I queue things up in advance, what is cool about this is when I wake up on Monday, I don't have to say, hmm, what should I, I go, oh, okay, I'm gonna post this. Boom, 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 done. I don't have to think about it. So this feels like more work at first, but once you've actually done it a few times, you start to realize how incredibly efficient it becomes. And it just really consolidates all of the little picky little things that can drive you up the wall. Okay, now this is what I do. You guys can do this any way you want, but I just have a folder in my Google Drive called Art Prof Instagram Posts, and I just put them in there. And I just know, okay, that's the next one. This one's on Thursday. Really easy, really straightforward to do. Okay, let's go over carousel posts. These are really effective and it's a great way to avoid redundant posts and people feeling like they're just seeing the same type of imagery over and over again. So a carousel post is basically where you embed up to 10 images into a single post. So for people to see the multiple images, they just keep swiping and swiping, then they see all of those, okay? Now, what some people do is they might take these four photos and put them in four separate posts. You certainly can do that. But a lot of people really enjoy this where you take these four images. This is a painting that I did a ways back of bread and butter. And you can see one of the images is the actual bread and butter itself. And then the other three paintings is three different stages of the same watercolor painting. So I would put all of them into that one carousel post. And these are really fun. For example, this is Kathy Speranza, who I interviewed earlier. And so these images I'm showing you guys right now of her charcoal drawings, this is the piece in progress, this is the piece finished, and then also I'm going to include these two detail shots. These would be great as a carousel. I think people really enjoy seeing it all clumped into one so you can see it all at once. And it is really great because it keeps people on Instagram and that's what Instagram wants. So this is one of those algorithm tricks because anytime Instagram releases some new feature, okay, some new filter or some new thing you can add to stories, you should use it because they want to promote people who are using their new features. So if you see a new feature, try to find a way to use it. And they're always introducing new ones all the time. And the carousel post is part of that. Somebody who bothers to swipe through every single image in the carousel post, they are therefore on Instagram more. YouTube is the same way. YouTube, they wanna get people watching videos as long as possible and for them to just keep staying on that platform. 
The second they leave, that's when YouTube and Instagram get set. So you, they're trying to get you to actually stay on those platforms. Okay, now the other thing you can do, which we've been having a lot of fun doing here at ArtProf, is you can actually turn your carousel post into a mini lesson plan. And we have found these, number one, <laughs> so fun, especially when it involves Benedict Cumberbatch. Tell me in the chat if you understand how I feel about Benedict Cumberbatch, because some people don't. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, you need to have your eyes checked or something. Anyway, we've been creating these lesson plans and we go through all the carousels. And then the key to this is when you end, you end the carousel with a call to action. So the final image, I'll put the thumbnail of the YouTube video and I'll tell people, okay, watch the video on YouTube, video link in profile. And so that's the key to get that carousel to keep moving. Because if you just post the images, yeah, that's fine. But it's really nice when you end with something that they can actually do. Oh, wow. A lot of people like him. Cool. I like you guys. When Willoughby says, watch the video yesterday. Yep. That was a slip of tongue. <laughs> Come on, you guys. Think about what all those fans call themselves. I'm not going to say it here, but they have a... I don't know, not, not so nice name for themselves. You guys can look that up later. And then, of course, you guys have to now go watch the Benedict Cumberbatch video tutorial on portrait mistakes. Okay, surprise your audience. For example, if you are a pen and ink artist like Song, and typically you are drawing beautiful, gorgeous, sumptuous pen drawings of imaginary landscapes, and that's typically what people expect to see on your Instagram, just draw a banana. Everybody will go, what? Like, <laughs> what happened to song? This is so weird. This is really cool, you guys, because you can surprise people and it's a great way to keep things exciting and fresh. And this just cracked me up so much because she basically took an etching needle and just drew on this banana. And then you can also do things like seasonal posts. So for example, this is eggs that song decided to draw on and she did this for Easter. Like, that's so cool. So I know, I know it's corny, it's silly, but it works. People like it. So if you want to get traction, this is the way to do it. Lauren Fanning says Benedict needs to read audiobooks. I could listen to his voice for days. Yeah, it's like 90% of it's the voice. I mean, yes, he's like, oh, he looks good too. But it's like the combination is just overwhelming. Wow. Okay. So if you guys want to check out Song's Instagram, I highly recommend it because her Instagram is like, oh my God, to die for. Like, I love her work to begin with, but even if I didn't love her work, I would still follow her because of how amazing her Instagram account is. She's really, really phenomenal. Song also did this scratch board tutorial, if you guys would like to check that out as well. Michelle Melton is saying, what about Twitch and streaming your process? Michelle, my feeling about Twitch is that it mostly, I think, is perceived as a platform for gamers. People do use Twitch to stream for art. I have definitely seen it before. But I think that actually streaming live on YouTube is probably better. Because my feeling from what I've seen is that YouTube is more for educational content I don't think a lot of people go to Twitch with the intention to want to learn something. Whereas I think half of YouTube is people trying to learn something. So I would suggest, Michelle, if you want to stream your process, do it on YouTube. I think that would be better. The other option is Instagram Live. I like YouTube better because it's easier to archive your content. But again, that's a stream for another day. Okay, tagging etiquette. This is very important, guys you got to learn good tagging etiquette because, wow, if you mess this up or if you don't do it, you're going to make a lot of people really, really mad at you. And that is not a good way to go about doing things. So I would just say anytime you want to show somebody's work, you want to mention somebody, you want to say, wow, this person really helped me out a lot. I really appreciate it. Do it. OK, always, always ask for permission, even if it's somebody who you think, oh, they'll be fine. No, ask them because there'll be one time that you don't ask when the person will not be okay. So I really, really recommend just being ridiculous. I know on Instagram, people probably think I'm crazy because when you guys submit to the art dares, people post stuff and I'm like, can we share? And sometimes I'm saying, can we share to the same person five times? But it doesn't matter. It's like, that's etiquette. That's to make sure 
confirm that everybody is okay with that. Wen is saying, is it appropriate to have any life stuff in our Instagram, like landscapes that we photograph that inspire our photos? Absolutely. You can totally include that as long as it's really relevant, but I would caution you, don't do it too much because there was one artist, I was doing some consulting work for them and they showed me their Instagram later and they were saying, oh, well, I was influenced by this artist and this landscape. And I'm not joking. Every other post was that. And I looked at the Instagram. I'm like, I can't even see you in this Instagram. This is like a Pinterest inspiration board. This is not really you. So when just make sure it doesn't clog up your Instagram to the point that people miss out on really seeing who you are. Sponsorship tags are really important. If anybody here, if you have any interest in being sponsored by a company or anything like that, you got to make sure you understand those protocols. For example, Windsor Newton has provided us materials for our scratch board tutorial. And so we tag them. We use hashtags. We have a relationship with Windsor Newton that allows us to do that. So I would just say, because I get a lot of questions from artists who say, oh, well, how do I get sponsorship? And how do I get this company to support me and send me free supplies so I can show off their stuff? I'm like, okay, well, you can try these things, but this is very important. You guys can't mess this up because this is a very quick way to get dropped really, really fast if you're not thinking clearly. Okay, again, if people just give you a hand, okay? This is just like giving credit. Now, I don't have to do this, okay? Like I wrote this lesson for the New York Times it was in one of the articles and I had help from all these other people, okay? And even some of the interns who created some of the illustrations, some of the examples for some of the lesson plans, I tagged them too, okay? And some people might say, oh, well, they're interns. It doesn't, I'm like, they did work for me. They helped me. They were a big part of this project. So I'm gonna tag them. This is very important, really nice for people to, I think, be credited for the work that they contributed to something. I think it's really good to tag locations, but don't do it until you're gone, okay? This is a safety thing, guys, okay? Really, I know it sounds a little paranoid, but I just believe in this. So for example, sometimes you'll go to the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum. Song did this beautiful drawing from their garden in the middle of the museum. And so she tagged the museum, which is cool because then you can go on Instagram and you can see, oh, look who is at the museum and what are they looking at? That is really, really cool. But Song tells me she does not post this until she's left the museum because you don't know who's out there following you. Maybe they're like a block away and they're a creep and they're going, you don't want to do that. Okay. So you can put the location, but don't do it until after you're gone. And this was especially helpful because when I did my drawing in Taiwan tutorial, we were all over the place. Like one day we were in Beitou, next day we were in Taipei. And it was just a really nice way for people to know where we were going on that trip. And we did the same thing with our China tutorial when we traveled to Guangzhou. So it's especially good. Those of you guys who are urban sketchers out there drawing on site, definitely take advantage of this. All right, let's talk about hashtags. Hashtags, I think, are sometimes a little controversial. Some people think, oh, they're not important. Other people think, no, they're super important. You have to do them. I'm sort of in the middle. I think, yeah, go ahead, do it. That's great. They're there. We might as well. But I do not think that hashtags will make or break your success on Instagram. But they're there for a reason. So you might as well just use those. So I think the important thing, you don't want to use ones that are too broad. Like, honestly, I don't know why anybody does hashtag art because it's like, really? <laughs> like, why don't we just do hashtag life? I think that's too broad. You don't want it to be too obscure though, because like liver sulfur, like who knows what that is, except like all the jewelry people on the planet. And gesture drawing is just right because it's not art, it's not drawing, but it's a little bit more specific. So I tend to like the ones that are a little bit more specific. I think that you can make them too long though. I think sometimes when they get really long like this, the possibility of a typo is extremely problematic. So I like to keep them fairly short. Um, and then you can make up your own hashtags. Like we have this new hashtag that we started called Artcraft Share. So this is for people that make artwork in reaction to one of our videos. 
you can use it on Instagram and then we can see the work you guys are making. Really, really cool. Kelsey Cello is saying, is Instagram a safe place for a conceptual artist to be taken seriously? I don't see why not. I mean, I don't think that there's any, this genre is not allowed type of thing on Instagram. I think it's just Instagram is like any other tool. You have to get it to work for you. And that's why it is so specific to the artist because the photographer is not gonna use it the same way that say a sculptor will use it. So you really have to custom tailor it to your own needs. Okay, you can use group hashtags as well. Oftentimes there's something that's like trending and stuff like that. Like usually towards the end of the year, there's stuff like these best nine 2019. And these I think are really fun. I think people really enjoy doing them and it's a great way for people to find each other. Filler posts. This is really handy, guys. I got this tip from Song Kang because you know how you have some weeks where you're just not that productive. You're not making a lot of work. You don't really have anything to post, but it's been a while and you sort of feel like you should post. So Song told me she does this thing where she just goes, has a cup of bubble tea, draws in her sketchbook for like a minute, <laughs> takes a photo, and there's your filler post. I just think this is brilliant. The other thing that she says, you should use Throwback Thursday. And this is really cool because usually if you post something from like a long, long time ago, the people who are following you right now probably haven't seen it. And so it's a nice way to share your older pieces, but also have an excuse to have a filler post. So this is a very cool tip. Aster Disaster is saying, do we know what kinds of rights we are giving away by posting on Instagram? Somebody should read the fine print, but honestly, if you guys are really worried about that, talk to a copyright lawyer. I think that would be the most accurate way to get that information. All right, let's talk about captions because captions, I think, can be problematic. They can be benign. They can also be helpful, depending on how you go about doing it. This is the type of caption I do not recommend. And I know a lot of you guys are doing it where you say, here's the title. This is what it's made out of. Here's the size. DM me if you want to buy it. It's available. If somebody wants to buy it, they will inquire, okay? This is not a good caption because it's very generic. It doesn't say anything about you. And it's just sell, 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 sell. It's not the way to get things sold. And it's a very strange thing. But like when you stop asking people to buy your stuff, it makes them want to buy it more. I know it's really weird the way it works. You can keep your captions really short. The caption for this post that I did was what's on my desk right now does not have to be anything substantial. It can also be really, really long because I like to write and I've had some really long posts. It's okay if you really do have something to say and you're a pretty decent writer, okay? So you can do this. I would just say, don't feel the pressure to do it unless you really, really want to and you've got a good reason because people do not go to Instagram to read text. They really, most of the time, don't read it. I know some people do, but people really aren't in that frame of mind. They're really thinking more about the images. You can also make your caption personal, okay? So this is Jordan McCracken Foster, our prof teaching artist. You gotta keep it personal because if you make it that generic, here's what I made, it's like people just lose interest. So say something about the work that nobody else can say. Now, here's where some of you guys are gonna start asking me these questions because this always happens when I give this lecture. How do I get followers? That is a golden question. This is the other thing I get. I did everything you told me to do. Why don't I have more followers? Why is nobody commenting on my Instagram? And this is where Instagram can get very unhealthy. And I would say, watch this stream if Instagram is driving you up the wall because chances are, you're one amongst millions of artists who feel the exact same way. And let me tell you, there's a lot of drawbacks to Instagram and it's got a lot of problems, but there are ways to cope with it. And it's very common to see that. Here's the secret, guys. Social media, if you want to do well, it's about interaction, okay? This is what happens. A lot of people say, I post all the time. Nobody's doing anything. I'm like, do you interact? No. Do you ever comment on anyone else's accounts? No. Do you ever have conversations? No. I'm like, that's why, because you're not interacting. That's the important thing. Because it would be like if somebody decided, oh, 
I know I'm going to open a florist shop and I'm going to get all the flowers and put them in there and set everything up. And then you just leave. And then you go, why is nothing selling? How come nobody's buying my flowers? Well, of course, because you're not there to talk to them, to interact with them. That is like such a big part of the in-person retail experience. And so you have to interact. Now, this is where it gets extremely time consuming because you can imagine you got to make the posts, you got to interact. It, it starts to really eat up a lot of time. And this is where a lot of people go, oh, I don't have time for all that. Well, yeah, I mean, this is what happens. Starving Artist says, a lot of people only focus on what they get from others on social media when they should also be liking and commenting with other people to maybe get them to come look at their page. Absolutely. Zoe says, I like writing captions as a way of keeping a record of my state of mind or the thought process. That's a great way to think about it, Zoe. I feel like if you treat it almost like a diary entry that feels very personal and intimate, that can be extremely effective. Here is basically what 99% of all artists on Instagram are doing. I don't know if you guys know Raz Shast, but she is a cartoonist for The New Yorker, one of my favorite artists. I think she's a total genius. Now, this cartoon, it's pretty old, so it's called Blog Breakdown. But you really could just write social media at the top. So she says that social media, if we substitute, one third of it is conspiracy theories. One third of it is stories about crap somebody sewed, cooked, or knitted. And the other third is self promotion. Everybody see that little guy in the corner saying, buy my book. The woman at the bottom, buy my paintings. That's what you're all doing. Okay. If you do that on Instagram, you're not going to have success because people are going to be annoyed. It's just going to be you saying, buy my paintings, buy my prints. It's really not a good way to go about doing that. Social media, it's not about you. I know you think it is because it's your Instagram account and it's your artwork, but it's about community. That's what you have to do to change your mindset. And I learned that through ArtProf because ArtProf really is a community. It really is not about me, 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 me. I mean, I'm here and I'm giving you guys information, but we're here to help people and to get you guys getting inspired, getting you guys learning about new things. That is all about community. And you have to change your mindset in terms of social media or you're not going to get anywhere. And here's an example of that. People notice comments. You guys in the chat, tell me, when you open your Instagram and you look at your notifications and you see, oh, I got one comment, 10 likes, and one new follower, you probably don't care that much about the likes. Maybe some people do, but you will read the comment. I mean, who here doesn't read comments? I would guess probably nobody. I read them all. I don't have a huge following, but I have enough that it takes time for me to read them. People really notice comments. So if you guys comment and reply, you will get results. So for example, I get former students, they comment on my Instagram a lot and they'll just say something, like, oh, I missed your class. And yeah, I mean, they're, they're not like art dealers. <laughs> like, it's not like I'm going to get a deal by talking to this former student, but I don't care. I'm like, cool. Hi. You know, I'll just give them an emoji or write something quick. I think that's important, you guys. And those little tiny steps they go such a long way, you guys, okay? So reply to those comments. Mr. Mystique says, do you know of any companies who help draw traffic to your social media and websites in the art world like Strong Promo? I'm not aware of that, Mr. Mystique, and I would be suspicious of that because I've never really heard of that before. So anyway, look it up and see what you can come up with. It also helps you guys comment on other accounts, okay? This is where the community part comes in. And you can make real connections with people who you thought, no way, okay? So the top comment is from this guy, JJ Kelly, who is on the Travel Channel. He has got this whole like documentary, all these like, cool travel um, shows and everything. And I comment on his Instagram now and then because I like all his stuff. And it's amazing. Like if you write like one sentence that is somewhat intelligent, wow, you'll get a reply. And I'm like, this is so cool. <laughs> and actually, Jarrett Krasoska, who is an illustrator, he's on the bottom. He graduated from RISD a year after me. I've never met him in person, 
but I've commented a couple of times on this Instagram and we've had some conversations and we actually did have an email exchange at one point. So this can go somewhere. It's just, it takes time. You're not going to get it overnight. Tazara says, I really like the comments that people take time to write, such as helpful feedback or thoughtful notes instead of the standard great work or nice comments. You know something, Tazara? It's the exact same way at ArtProf. When you guys write us those comments, I read every single one and it takes forever. And there are probably other things I should be doing, but I find it extremely exciting and important for me to understand our community better. So this is very, very important. All right. Also, you guys should be following stuff. You should be looking at things. If this is an art gallery that you want to get into, then follow their Instagram. If you want to be a comics artist and you look at Kat Huang's Instagram and you think, oh, I really want to see what she's doing, then follow her. If you want to know what's happening in the New York City art scene and you want to see the latest stuff in the Chelsea Gallery, I would follow Roberta Smith because she is the chief critic of art at the New York Times. She goes to everything that's in New York City. She's a great person to check out because I don't have time to go to New York City all the time. So she's really good. Or maybe you watched the interview that I did with Kathy Speranza today and went, oh my God, her paintings make me swoon just like me. You go to her Instagram and say, you know what? I want to follow her too. So here's the thing. It's a give and take, you guys. This is mutual. You start the conversation and you keep it going. One thing you can do too, you can ask a question. Now there are two different kinds of questions. For example, you could say, should I add blue? Which is pretty easy. Anybody can say, yeah, add the blue. I'll say, nah, don't add the blue. This is what does not work. And this is what everybody does. What do you think? Who has time <laughs> to formulate that kind of thought? Because then you're like, yeah, I don't know what I think. Okay, there's, there's Michael Fassbender. Yeah, okay, I'm done. <laughs> you know, it's like, you can't make people work so hard on social media. So Song Kang, she once posted this and she said, okay, I got a darker version and I have a lighter version. Which do you like better? This was so easy for people to say, yep, one on the right. I like that one better. That is significant interaction. People love polls. Any way that you guys can get people to interact. Sometimes I do a sweep. I just decide, you know what? I'm going to overhaul this. If you guys decide to do that to your account, don't delete the posts. You should archive them because you don't know. Maybe at some point you're going to change your mind and going to realize, oh, I think I want to bring that back. Archiving never hurts. Deleting does though, because then it's a big pain to bring it back. You should also think about the order and variety of your posts. Okay. Look at the emojis at the top. Look at the ones on the bottom. I don't know about you guys, but I am not following the globe emoji Instagram because it's the same thing over and over again. I am going to follow the animal Instagram though, because that one is really cute and adorable. Now, if you guys go to Ayame's Instagram, oh, I swoon over Ayame's Instagram. Oh my God. I mean, I love her work to begin with, but if you want to see somebody who does really gorgeous shots and layouts and look at her Instagram. You guys can learn so much and do that. Look at other people's stuff, see what they're doing and just use their techniques and use what I'm telling you today and you will see an impact. Okay. Now, finally, for your profile, this stuff's important guys. Okay. Nuts and bolts, professional photo of you. Okay. Not the picture at your 15th birthday because you thought it was cute back then. Okay. Uh-uh. Well, for most of us, it was not cute. But anyway, for me, it was not cute at all. Um, your Instagram handle is really important, guys. Don't make it strange and don't make it really long or difficult to spell or to remember. If you're like me, you lucked out and your name is very easy to use. But here's an example. Kat Huang, who is a teaching artist at ArtProf, she has changed her Instagram handle four times in the time that I've known her. Okay, so when she was Kathy Rocks, I thought, oh, that's easy. I can totally remember that. It's really catchy. But then she wanted something a little bit more professional sounding. So she changed it to c.huang.m. And I thought, Kat, I can never remember your Instagram handle. Because I could never remember. Was it huang.c, c.huang. Like, I, I could not keep it straight. And then she changed it to Kat Huang Illustration. 
I said, Kat, that's so long. Like, I don't want to like tap that out. <laughs> that's really, really long. And so I said, why don't you just change it to Kat Fong Art? And now I have no trouble remembering her Instagram. So these things really, really make a difference, you guys. Tag your professional affiliations. For example, I am at ArtProf. I also teach at RISD. So I tag those. Makes it very legitimate. It's not like just some random thing that you made up. And this clickable link in your profile, it is the one place on your Instagram where people can literally tap on a link and go somewhere. Now, I know some people use things like Linktree where you can get like multiple links on there. But in my opinion, if you have done your work on your website and all your social media stuff, you should not need something like that. You should be able to have it more consolidated. The other thing I do, I change that link all the time to direct people. So for example, if we release a new tutorial, then I will say link in profile and I will change that link to that video. That is really, really helpful to do. That way people really understand where to go and you can get them there quickly. So you do it like this. So you just say in the caption, link in profile, they know they can go there and get the link right away. You wanna tap on your profile pic to create a new Instagram story. And Instagram stories, guys, they're really worth it. Okay, I have to admit, I thought they were really dumb, okay, for the longest time. I was like, this is so dippy, this dump of whatever that people are just dropping in Instagram stories. But I'll tell you, I sometimes like the stories more than I like people's posts because I think they are so ridiculous sometimes. And actually, I, I have to credit Instagram stories for my hot white men series, <laughs> because this is where I worked out all of my like thirstiness for Michael Fassbender and Vermeer paintings, you know, at the same time. And actually it ended up being something that I stored as an Instagram highlight so people could visit it later because people were asking me for these lessons. And then eventually that got turned into full out YouTube videos. So it, it goes to say, you guys never, judge something, you know, like I really thought it was the dumbest thing. And now here I am like loving them to death. So experiment with Instagram stories. They seem ridiculous, but you can do some really fun things with them. And I think people really do engage with them in a very different way. Now you guys can also watch, we have this artist Instagram critique. We critique Albert Gonzalez's Instagram. We give tips to him on his Instagram. This would be a great video for you guys to watch. So you can see different mistakes, different adjustments that I ask them to do. You can also purchase an artist website or Instagram critique. Just go to artprof.org, click on purchase a critique. And I hope you guys will join us on Discord because that's where all the cool kids are hanging out. That's where I hang out. So it might, well, probably not. It's not cool if I hang out there. Anyway, there's pockets of cool people on Discord that you can hang out with and I'll just come along every now and then. Check out ourprof.org, lots of free resources for you guys there. Subscribe to our channel and join the ArtProf family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters who make all of this possible. Thank you to everybody for all of your comments in the chat. I'm sorry I didn't get to more of them, but thank you so much for sharing everybody. Everybody stay safe. I will see you next time. Bye.